My name is Redo Meyer. I am Ian Nee Lewis. And today on the App Clinic, we'll be examining shopping lists. Woohoo! Gotta love that intro. <laughs> All right, each week on the App Clinic, we take a look at apps within a particular category and we give them a technical review. Uh, our focus is on helping developers build better apps, so we'll be interspersing our commentary with some technical advice, including some code snippets. Now, the hope is that those of you who are watching, as well as the developers whose apps we're reviewing, uh, will you know, learn a few tips and tricks and uh, best practices creating apps that'll delight your users. We're all about the delight here. Um, so this week, uh, like I said, we're looking at shopping apps. To be more specific, apps that help you shop by letting you write lists of things to shop for. Right, so shopping list apps. Basically, yeah. Okay. So there's four apps on the patient list today. They are Out of Milk, Grocery IQ, Zoom Tasks, and some French thing that we don't know how to pronounce, but we're going to call it Prixing. It could be Preying. We're going to go with Prixing, but uh, if there are any French language speakers watching, please uh, let producer Lewis know so he can correct us live on air, because we or do just, like to be correct. Or just mock us in the YouTube comments. That well, happens all the time. That's pretty much standard practice, so By I don't the way, we need to tell anyone that. If the, if the dude that thinks we work for Apple is back, <laughs> say, hey! And we, you know, I was thinking about like how could we prove that we're working for Google? I, no way. It's it's hard. I, I mean, we're we're in front of a green screen here. It could be anyone. It could we be could anywhere, be in yeah. Cupertino right now. Yep. We're not. But With I guess just a be. little camera punched into Andy's old office. That would like, be something. This is this is where this is where the spy cam was. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's worth a shot. That's that's not an insinuation, by the way. No. And of course, I'm speaking only of a hypothetical version of some company that has no relation to any company in reality. Ah, <sighs> moving right along. Let's move on. Um, so we're going to take a, a quick lightning round view of some of the apps that we're going to be looking at today. So we're going to go through them really quickly now and then dig a little bit deeper later. Uh, so the first of those apps, Grocery IQ, uh, I think can best be described as your ultimate grocery companion. It's got integration with coupons, loyalty cards, it lets you share sync lists between your friends and your family, and has a lot of really convenient ways to input items into your list, including things like barcode, autocomplete, favorites, all of that good stuff. So this was one of my favorites. I'm looking forward to digging a little bit deeper into this one. Out of Milk is less of a shopping app and more of a list management app that happens to mention shopping as a possible application. Uh, now I'd say the visual, visual design is lush. It has an op animated background on the opening screen. It has little skeuomorphic touches here and there. Uh, and it has a crisp and responsive UI. Uh, now, it separates lists into three different categories, shopping, pantry, and to-do. And as far as we can tell, the idea behind the app is to stock your pantry list with the items that you use and then move them to your shopping list when you run out. And that sounds like a great idea. But as we'll see, there are a few hitches in the execution. Oh, we're smooth with these transitions. It's wonderful. Um, so, Prixing, like Grocery IQ, is a full service shopping companion. It's got coupons, offers from nearby stores, and keeps hold of all of your loyalty cards, and even offers price comparison, which is, I think, the only one of these particular apps which does that. Uh, it's also entirely in French, uh, which is either a huge bonus or a serious drawback, depending on your perspective. So, we'll go into a little bit more detail on that later as well. And finally, Zoom tasks, which I think I'm saying correctly. I have no idea. You know, time and, again, time and again, we've looked at apps that had promising functionality, but then found that they cut corners on polish. It's like the developers ran out of rent money and had to ship. But uh, Zoom tasks is the opposite of that. This app does almost nothing functionality-wise, but the polish is actually above average. In fact, it's so good and so simple that Zoom feels less like an app and more like a resume from somebody who wants to create apps for a living. But if you look at it in that light, Zoom has some cool features. We're going to take a particular look at one later on, the data validation animation, which I think is really cool. But before we do that, let's talk about today's prescriptions. All right, and before we do that, I want to a uh, big shout out to the folks who mentioned that our audio was in reverse. So we had the person on the left coming from the right audio channel. Whoa. Nice. Wait, I thought YouTube wasn't even in stereo for us. Apparently it is. 
<laughs> Rock on. If you mess with people's heads. Hopefully this that's been fixed now. Thank you for letting us know. This is going to be great. This is and and it's like total stereo separation. So it's sort of like the '60s sounds like a Beatles record. Absolutely, which uh, is always our yeah. uh, our goal. Look, so I'm over uh, here. Ringo's over there. <laughs> So let's, uh, let's have a look at the prescriptions. I'm going to put them behind us because this is going to be up on screen for a little while. Indeed. Um, so we're looking at shopping list apps. And I think really the acid test here comes down to one simple question. How is this better for me than a piece of paper and a pen? Right, because a piece of paper fits in my pocket. Got them all over the house. Load time for a piece of paper is zero. There's no latency. There really isn't. You type, it's there. You don't even have to do anything neatly. You can just scribble something in your handwriting, do times two, whatever, and it automatically makes sense. Spouses never get mad if you're looking at a piece of paper instead of typing at your phone. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, which is you know, particularly important when you're in a shopping center if you do happen to be holding your phone up. For whatever reason, uh, grocery stores seem to be built within Faraday cages. It's a little unexpected, but it means that if you've got an app which depends on an internet connection, it's really not going to be that useful for you. Um, well, I could say this about any app. You know, whether you're in a grocery store or not, True. there are going to be dead zones. No matter how great your carrier is, I don't care. So you've got to work without a connection, and you've got to do it seamlessly. Now, also, speaking of wives and spouses, mm. I want to be able to share my list. You know, I have things that I need my wife to go pick up when she's yeah. shopping. She has things for me. Sometimes we go shopping together. So I want to be able to, for her to see my list items. I want to see her list items. And when I pick something else up, I want to make sure that it gets checked off on both our devices so we don't end up with duplication. Absolutely. And I think that's a really important point. And we want to make that as simple as possible. So if we are sharing lists and uh, authenticating ourselves so we can back things up on the cloud, which even without sharing, I want this stuff to live on the cloud so that it just works mm -hmm. and I can never lose things. I want that authentication flow to be as simple as possible. Uh, I don't want to have to go through four pages and three redirects just to be able to uh, log into this, to this app. Hey, I don't even want to type in my email address. Right. Uh, we, we talked about this before. You know, every every click that you have to make to be able to get to what you want to do is an opportunity for a user to go, eh, to hell with this, and hit the home screen button and get out of your app. If we're going to count clicks, like keystrokes as clicks as well, then it's not going to get too far into your uh, email address before they're like, that. Ah, to hell with this. Exactly. I personally never run an app if it asks me to type in my email address. My email address is on the phone. Mm -hmm. But there's other things that you can do to save people time, too. Absolutely. I mean, the shopping apps are the kind of thing where most people buy the same thing. Absolutely. Give me some autocomplete. Uh, look uh, at my contacts. Favorites, Remember things I've bought beforehand. Sure. You know, let me add those things again. Um, yeah, like you say, barcode scan. Let me just take a picture. Maybe I don't even need to write it down. Just take a photo of whatever I want. That's enough to put Get me. fine location and microphone permissions so that if I'm in my bedroom sobbing and I'm all alone, it will remind me to buy beer. It looks like you need whiskey. Yeah. Exactly. That would be a useful feature. Um, I'm not sure if any of the apps we looked at today offer that, but I guess I might be going a little far it. there. But uh, you never know. It's good, to, it's good to set lofty goals. Exactly. OK, so those are the prescriptions we have. Let's see how our apps measured up. OK, so yeah, let's, uh, let's dig into each of those. And so the, uh, the first app that we wanted to take a look at is actually uh, Out of Milk. Mm -hmm. Which I think you took a look at. So this this is the uh, the, the so, Google Play listing. Yeah, exactly. And I just had one thing to say about this, which is I think that the basic design of the logo is good. It's fun. It gets the point across. But that little to-do list on their feature graphic is probably twice as big as it needs to be, and their logo is half as big. Those, those should really be rejiggered some. But let's not spend too much time on that. Let's bring up the app on our giant fake phone. Oh, why isn't the giant fake phone coming up? What? Very disappointed, eh? What happened? I'm not sure. I'll try unplugging it and replugging it back in. That always works. <laughs> the big you reveal for the giant phone. OK. It's oh, interesting. I'm seeing no lights on the. Uh, on the giant phone controller. So I'm going to duck out of sight try and figure out why that is. I wonder if, the, does this thing just get too hot, do you think? Because it seems like this always fails on us sooner or later. Oh, there it is. Ah. Is it coming up? Almost. Now try unplugging it's, uh, it, replugging it back in. Yeah, it's coming. Oh, 
Oh, giant fake photo. Well, this is a really good time to remind our audience that we are doing this live. That is why we have an excuse for this sort of nonsense. But since we're doing it live, we'd be happy to take your feedback. Uh, Producer Lewis is watching the YouTube comment stream. I think he's also taking a look at our G Plus page. So if you want to get in touch with us and give some questions, comments, anything you'd like us to talk about that we're not already talking about, uh, we'll see if we can ske squeeze you in. Well, we have been told that, Ian, you're a little loud. So we probably need to fix that on that the mixer. Always happens. All right, so we're going to uh, try and make Ian a little bit quieter, and uh, I'm also going to try and restart Wirecast real quick because. Good lord, really? Well, I think that's, that's the only way we're going to get that video up. Maybe so. Video stream on pause for a moment, and then you will come back. That's so right. So we will be. Tight, live viewers. We will be right. paused, um, but do bear with us. Don't all run away, and uh, we will be back in just one brief moment. Goes. Yeah, well, we're still seeing the black. Yeah, we are still seeing the black. I think we're back now. So thank you for your patience. Those of you who are still around. Frustratingly, we still don't seem to have any actual video. We had it there for a second. Yeah, it was working great. And now, well, oh, hey, hey, all right. To give up for all time. Indeed. Okay. Thank you for your patience, everyone. We are. Uh, it says that it's broadcasting. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. We're going to do this baby weatherman style. What? Oh, nice. What All right. If you're still watching, the reason we're looking confused is Reto tripped over a cable. Just the monitor. It's okay. What can go wrong? Just the monitor. Yeah. Okay. So are we still going? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. We're just wasting time. Excellent. In other ways behaving entirely as expected. Well, thank God we had an excellent rehearsal. Yes, that's but a right. full yeah. dress rehearsal for Absolutely. this session. Nothing that's exactly on. why everything is better. <laughs> I really feel the preparation and the way in which it's, uh, it's really come together here. Absolutely. Well, I think the human element is better. It's the technology that lets us down. You know why? Computers can't rehearse. <laughs> that's right. All right. Perfect. So I'm okay. Too quiet now. So, Rachel, you want to drive out of milk so I can be Mr. Weatherman? I, I would love to. Now, one thing that we did in rehearsal, actually, that uh, we can't see the <laughs> see what I did there. I'm going to call it rehearsal. Yeah. Uh, so, one thing we did earlier that we won't be able to reproduce is the entry experience in Out of Milk is a significant amount of time. It goes through a, I think, nine or ten page tutorial, which it would have been nice to be able to skip. Now, the other thing that Out of Milk does it is it asks for me to sign it. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so it's this thing. So there's no obvious way to get past this other than scrolling through the whole thing. Right, exactly. Uh, and then it asks me to sign in. Now, it gives me the ability to sign in with uh, Google and with Facebook. A couple of issues there. Uh, first, uh, I would like to sign in with whoever, honest, honestly. But I realize that you know, standards being what they are or not, that's not necessarily possible. So it's great that we have Google and Facebook as options. The only problem is if I try to sign in with Google, it takes me to a web page, a web view, which I think we don't have because we're in one of those Faraday cages. Exactly. Who knew you could buy groceries here? It's incredible. Yeah. The problem is, we oh, there we go. The problem is now I've got to fill this out. And unless I completely trust this app, I shouldn't. Mm -hmm. now, this is a, uh, something a lot of people don't know, but I think tech savvy people know this, is that on a phone, going through this flow isn't going to add to your security at all because the app developer can actually read directly out of that web view. This OAuth flow was created for web apps that run in standards compliant browsers, not in a web view that sits inside another application. So with the web view, or I, I'm sorry, with a web app on your desktop, the question is, do you trust your browser? Hmm. With this sort of thing, the question is, do you trust the random app creator that put this together? Personally, sorry, Out of Milk guys, but I don't. So it's nothing personal. He trusts no one. So let, we'll talk a little later about how to make that easier. But let's remember that this is not the way to go if you want your users to stay engaged. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So, let's, uh, <coughs> so what we've got here right on the front page is, again, sort of this dashboard pattern uh, that you can see. And it's, it seems like an odd fit for this app. Well, it's kind of cool because you get this you know, little like moving background behind there. It's, it's pretty, but it's a complete waste of space, and it's a waste of my time. Yeah. If I want to categorize my list, that's great. But I'm not really sure that these three categories are the way that I would do it. Even if it were, I think I'd prefer to swipe between them or have some other way of choosing them rather than that dashboard, even though the dashboard is pretty. And as you can see, as we're going through each of these lists, they look identical. They just have a different heading. And so I really just want to be able to click this and choose between those different lists. They do behave a little differently, but that's mm -hmm. not actually a plus. So yeah. for instance, let's check out the shopping list if you want to add uh, an item. You type in the name of the item. Or you speak it, because it's got the microphone icon there. That's nice. Yeah. What, what happens if I add an item from the uh, pantry list, though? If I go to the pantry, I'm automatically given a list of suggestions uh, to add, which is really nice. And I can still type them in, which is a good step. But it does show me all of these things. It would be really nice to mm -hmm. have that same functionality in both parts of the app. Right. I mean, it, you feel like you know what was going through these guys' mind. It, they're thinking, oh, we've got this great functionality for the pantry. And so we'll split that off from the shopping list, which has this different functionality. But it turns out that that functionality is useful everywhere. Now, the other thing that I kind of wish this app did differently is when it comes to checking off items. I mean, what, what are the two things that you always do with list apps? Do you add things and you, uh, you check them off as done? Exactly. If, and this is, I think, probably just a rule of thumb that we can say for certain, but you know, Roman Nurek should probably weigh in on this. But here's what I think. If the two most common behaviors in your entire app can't be accomplished without uh, double tapping or long pressing, there's something wrong with your UI design. So how am I going to check off an item there? So yeah, I click the item, and I can click done, so that, that works. Right, so if you, if you just single click, you're going to see that, uh, that toolbar come up. And that's great, at least it's discoverable. But why isn't there a checkbox just next to the item? Exactly. And in fact, if I long press, which isn't particularly discoverable, it does the, uh, it does the done. But what I really expect this to do is when I do a long press to get a contextual action bar. Something which let me multi-select items and, uh, and do many of the things here. So bulk move, bulk delete, bulk copy, those sorts of things, mm -hmm. uh, all part of the contextual actual bar would be a really nice user pattern. Now, we talk a lot about apps where it seems like the developer ran out of time. And to me, this is the, this is the evidence. Uh, it's almost a to-do list of stuff that we need to figure out how it works in the, in the UI properly. Right. There's a gargantuan list of features that obviously exist in the bowels of the app, but there's no UI to launch them. And there was very little thought given to how these things fit together. So there's just this jumble of different things that you might want to do. You know, sharing versus settings versus history. All of these things could be done in a way that makes them task focused. Mm and discoverable, but instead they're sitting on this gargantuan menu bar that's almost unusual. Absolutely. And so that's probably the biggest piece of advice that I would have uh, for, the, for the people behind uh, Out of Milk is think more about the, the typical user workflow. What are the most common things that they're going to want to do? Make it as simple as possible. You don't want to have to think about, well, how do I move something from my, like you, you'll see this every time I want to change something, I'm clicking like three or four different places. Because I don't want to have to hit back, because that implies that I'm undoing something. I just want to change my navigation location. So I want to click here and then choose pantry list. But I don't. I have to go back mm -hmm. and then click pantry. So it's already two clicks. And so how do I get my chicken broth here? Uh, how do I get that into my shopping list? Well, and there's no up affordance on this thing that looks a lot like an action bar, but isn't. Exactly. And again, I mean, we say this a lot, but you know, Go nuts with your custom design, but if you make a design that looks like a built-in Android feature, either make it work exactly like it or rethink your design, because otherwise you're just going to confuse people. Exactly. So really, I think um, the, the suggestion I would have here is simplify your navigation, simplify your workflow, optimize the app for whatever the most typical or desirable workflow is. So it should be really easy to add things to your shopping list using all of the autocomplete magic which is in Pantry. 
when you've bought things, it should move into your pantry because you've bought them, so now they're in your pantry. And then from there, you should be able to click, do a single click, which then moves it back into your shopping list. And so then you'll have an app which continues to grow and become more and more useful the more you use it uh, without having to do a lot of pre-population. Uh, no one is going to sit down and put everything that they currently have in their pantry into this, uh, into this app to make their life potentially easier in the future. It needs to build on itself. Exactly. Well, I think we've probably spent enough time oh, talking right. about uh, the particular things that Out of Milk may or have done right or wrong. Why don't we talk a little bit about some of the technical things that they might be able to do to make this app a little better or friendlier. Absolutely. I mean, I seem to have lost my clicker, which is handy. Hmm. Probably it's uh, oh, it's over here. Things. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so one of the things which uh, this app does, uh, which a lot of these apps do, or at least one of the key pieces of functionality, is sharing lists. And so, uh, the way that you do that is you, you know, choose someone you want to share it with, sends them an email, says, "Hey, you know, this uh, this has been shared, and you can follow a link to it." Now, what would be really neat is if you could take that one step further and actually have that link automatically open up your app. Exactly. And it's, it doesn't even have to be email. It's any web link That's right. that, that I want to have do something in my app, That's right? right? So if you're you know, browsing the website associated with this or someone, you know, if your wife tweets you the link because that's just how she rolls, sure. you want that all to work. And you so got you your bit.ly link or whatever? Yeah, precisely. Sure. Right? So what you want to do is you can actually intercept any URL that's clicked within an application by registering an intent filter against the activity that wants to react to it. Um, and so what happens then is whenever that URL is clicked within a web view, browser, text view, anything really, uh, it's going to launch a new view intent. And the URL associated with, uh, with that click action is going to be included as a data parameter. And so if you can create uh, an intent filter like this one, uh, and that's, you can see here that it's specifying the, the host, um, the protocol type, the scheme, I should say, and the path. So this is really important. So here we're going to say, we're going to intercept links for my website, but not everything. I still want people to be able to view my website on the device. Mm -hmm. But if they click on a shared shopping list, then that's something that my app can handle. Uh, and so you can do something really clever with this in that um, you can have your actual website redirect to Google Play or to a please download my app type link. So if, if the app is installed, you can view the shared uh, list straight away. If it isn't, then you can encourage people to install the app. So if the app's installed, it'll just eat that link because it fit that particular form of my website or exactly. you know, the app's website. Exactly. But if the app's not installed, then it's going to cruise right past and into the web browser or whatever you have set up to handle Precise. generic links. Precise. And in fact, the user is going to be prompted um, with the opportunity to either use your app to, uh, to launch, uh, to, to fulfill that link, or to, to view it in the browser. So the option is still there. Uh, this is something that YouTube does. It's something that um, the Google Maps does, all to try and create that magical experience. Now I have to I have to admit the first thing that came into my head when I, I heard you talking about this is well what if I just intercept my Google Play link? Uh, well, that's interesting. So why would you want to do that? Well, maybe I don't want to set up a maybe I don't want to set up a server. I don't want to set up a redirect. Maybe I don't have the ability to do that. Well, see that would be the challenge because uh, you're wanting to intercept a link using an app that isn't installed. Indeed, so that but that's the whole point, though, right? If the if the app is not installed, it'll go to Google Play. Uh -huh. If it is installed, so if someone tries to follow a link to your app on yes. the device when your app is installed, you want it to open your app instead of. Google. Well, I'm not saying me, <laughs> uh, but a friend of mine a friend, asked a guy you know. Yeah, I guess you could do that. I'm not entirely sure what the use case would be for it, but yeah. I, we actually have had that that question go through tech support. There you go. So yeah, yeah I guess that's mm. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably better to put a redirect in because you want to have some some control yeah. over what you're doing, and Absolutely. and I and you definitely don't want to be in the position where users can't get to your play link to update or to see reviews or whatever, or yeah, exactly. you know, God forbid, you mess it up and end up hijacking play for everybody. So <laughs> yeah, that's not I, I bring it up as a counter example. Okay. But uh, some really interesting things you can do with this. Totally. Um, so let's, uh, let's have a look. So one of the, uh, I think there was a, another technical uh, tip that you wanted to provide. Uh, well, actually, you know, mistake. I was thinking about how much I hate typing in my email address. And there hasn't really been a wonderful way here for to, to fix that. Mm. 
But we just recently released something called Google Play Services. Nice. And it turns out that the Google Play Services API, which is a, an extra in the Android SDK, just like billing or licensing or these other things that you add on, has a way to register and you know, essentially federate accounts without having to write a bunch of code, without having to deal with OAuth, and importantly, without having to request extra permissions. Nice. So what, uh, what you want to do is, same thing I did, which is check out this link. It's the Google Developers link. That's where the Google Play services live, because it's a Google API. It's not an Android API. Uh, <clears throat> but it's a really nice add-on, and you're more or less guaranteed to have it on the system if you have Froyo or above and a recent version of Market. Now, it's not exactly that easy, but it's really close. Uh, this is a backwards compatible library. You don't have to update the phone. There's no OTA involved. As long as you read the documentation, you'll understand how to use it. So what can you do with this? Well, let's take a look at this code. First thing that you often want to do is get the user's account so that you can figure out who this user is. Mm. So Google Play Services has a nice convenience method to help you do that. And this works uh, back to Froyo. Now, we did add a conven similar convenience method to the framework in ICS. Uh, but this is backwards compatible. So you just launch this intent, and it will launch the picker dialog for accounts. And you can say which type of accounts you want. In this case, uh, com.google is the, the name of the account. And that'll bring you back a string that uh, in fact, I think it's on the next slide. We'll, we'll use that string in an on activity uh, result. The string will be an identifier for the account. Now, you'll probably notice immediately that the identifier for Google accounts is actually your Gmail address, but you can't count on that. Uh, that's not at all required, and it very well may change in the future. So what you really want is an ID that you can associate with this user to tell you two things. First. They are who they say they are in, in the sense that it's really them saying, sure, use my account. And second, you have some sort of ID that you can use to federate. You, know, you, have, an, you have an ID that you can store in your database. It's not going to change. And every time you see that ID come from an Android device, you know, oh, yeah, that's this key in my database. So the way you do that uh, in this example is use the user profile API. Now, this is actually, I think it's a, uh, an open ID leftover, actually. Okay. Uh, but you don't need to know anything about open ID to use it. All you do is specify the OAuth scope, which I actually had to do a little digging for. So I made sure and put it in this slide. Uh, it's you know, OAuth colon blah, 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 blah. It ended up with user.profile. Now, once you've got the scope, you send it to Google Core, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Google Play Services, and it will try to acquire you a token. There's two things that can happen at this point. You either get a token or you get a response back that says, sorry, you can't have a token, but here's why and here's the way to fix it. Because usually the reason you don't have a token is because the user hasn't actually authorized you to look at their information. So if you launch that intent, what you'll get is a very nice little dialog that essentially says, this app wants to look at your basic profile data. Do you want to allow them? And as long as the user clicks through and says yes, then you'll get a token back that you can use to make web service calls to this API. Now, if you're like me, the first time you get into calling web services, it feels a little tricky. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Fortunately, with this API, it couldn't be easier. Let's take a look at the next piece of code. All you do is get a URL connection and set up the, the particular URL with the token that you were given. So that's all you need to do. It's, it's a one call thing. And the response that you get back will actually contain the user's profile data. It's uh, JSON formatted. And we can take a look at that right now. Oh, so this is an example of what you get back if you query my profile data, for instance. You get uh, my, my name, or at least what I told Google my name is. 
uh, and you've got uh, a date of birth, but no year, uh -huh. no email address, Which no way like to contact me. A lot me. of people have their, uh, their year of birth sort of tied into their email address, so it could be tricky if you, uh, if you gave that access. Uh, that's quite possible. Or it could just be the year of a very pleasant scotch that you drank once. That's quite possible. Indeed. The important thing here is, uh, is that you're getting enough information to be able to identify this person when they come back. So there's some, the, you get their first name and last name so you can actually refer to them by name. People love that. Absolutely. But more importantly, you get an ID. This is actually their Google Plus ID, which is tied to that user and won't change the way an email address might. Mm. Or the, the way a name might, in fact. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, that's really nice. So don't, don't make your users type in email addresses and passwords anymore. This is a click-through interface that does the exact same thing. And unlike the web view that we saw earlier, it's secure. Actually secure, which is a nice touch. Indeed. All right, so let's uh, move on. Let's move on. Let's have a, a look at the, uh, the next app that we wanted to check out is a Grocery IQ. <laughs> Look, my head is an IQ. Oh, it's going to be a first time for everything. <laughs> let's, let's, let's take a look. It's, uh, so this, this is an app that I quite like, uh, Grocery IQ. It's probably my favorite of the apps that we look at today. And you can tell that the developers behind this app have really spent a lot of time and effort trying to create something that is as fully featured as possible. Um, you've got all this, the obvious sorts of stuff that you like. So you can see here, it's got autocomplete, uh, which is nice and fast and rich. And it actually goes a step further. And you can see here, once you've, auto, uh, once you've added these things in, it automatically character, uh, categorizes them for you as well, which is a really nice tip. Um, you can see all of the sort of obvious things are right there. You've got the, the checkbox next to things as well, so you can just add things to your list really easily, check them off really easily. And so it's got that core functionality of what is this app for, how does this make my life easier, is really obvious right off the bat, um, which is nice. Exactly. So one thing that I really love about this app is the way that it knows everything already. Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, we can't show this, but it actually does have pictures that would actually be sitting right along here. Nice. That'll, That's really handy. Eh? It'll show you a little bottle of whiskey, for instance. Because just in, case, just in case, well, yeah, in case you forgot. Well, and this can be really useful because it seems kind of obvious. It's like, well, I've added it to the list, so I know what it looks like. Except that maybe someone else added it to the list, and you don't know what it looks like. And so having a picture right there from something someone else added is really useful. And this is a really good example of an app which is trying to one-up paper. Um, so where paper is just whatever you wrote down here, you get to know what category it's in, which means you know what aisle it's in. And you can then sort by aisle, so you can make sure that you're shopping trip is actually optimized using the traveling salesman problem. Yeah, it's amazing how the uh, the presence of these cloud databases just can change the most mundane app into something really magical. I don't think there's a worldwide database, and I certainly couldn't find exactly. a lot of my favorite things in this particular app, but I can see that if I'm in the right location, it's really, really handy because not only does it know the sorts of things that might be available, it also knows what they cost and can compute the tax for me. So it can do a lot of mundane tasks without me even thinking about it. I love that. Absolutely. And I think that's what this app does really, really well, is it has thought about this workflow. And so the first time I use it, it's instantly useful. And it's already adding things to my list which I wouldn't have thought of. So all of the data that it pulls down from the web around the products that I'm adding is instantly useful. Pictures, cost, categories, all of those things are great. And what I really like is that they've gone that extra step. So by default, it's just going to go to your grocery store. But you can actually add your own shops. And so there's a Whole Foods and a Safeway near my place that I shop at. You can then add the aisles that they have and reorder them. That's right. I, I found that by pressing on grocery store. I had a little mm -hmm. chat on there. Um, but what, what was disappointing is once I started looking at a list that has you know, just two options, any store or grocery store, and thinking, wow, it would be nice to add another store to this, then I didn't know how. Yeah. It seems like they missed a golden opportunity here to make the app flow even more magical yes. by looking at this and saying, well, if a user sees an incomplete list, what are they going to want to do? Add something to it. So why put that anywhere else? Why so put that functionality so somewhere else? It would be nice to see this working in the same way that the account manager works. So you can choose between your accounts or you can add one if it's not there. And it, it helps you to understand the functionality that this app 
provides. And there's a lot of it. Um, and so trying to put that front and center and easy to sort of expand your use of the app is, uh, is I think, a, really, a real benefit. Um, it does a lot of clever things, like uh, when you have checked out, so once you've uh, finally removed everything from the list, add it to your history, making it easier for you to then add things back for future lists. Adding favorites is really simple. But this is something that, uh, that you actually pointed out to, to me, Ian, is uh, the favorites handling could be a little bit sensible. Mm -hmm. If that's a word. I love that word. Let's use word. it. That's a bar. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, like you pointed out, the favorites tab here already has a star on it. Hmm. Uh, why don't I just see that star in the list here? Exactly. And, and in fact, if you look at that list, then there may be a golden opportunity here because we have these carrots over on the side here. Uh, which are kind of meaningless in, in an Android world, at least yeah, today. I think it makes sense if you're on an on OS where they're, you're guaranteed to get a right to left sliding animation when you move from a list item to a detail. Mm. But that's not what Android does. It has a zoom animation. Yeah. And you do like a funky kind of vortex zoom icon. Right. right but we wouldn't do that because we're not insane. Yeah, particularly because, and this is the important thing, is that the animation between activities isn't guaranteed. Uh, it can be changed by OEMs, by different platform versions, and so you don't want to make any assumptions as to what screen animation is going to happen when you click something on the screen. You really don't. So what we've just trained users to think in, in Android is that if you click on a list item, it will take you to the details for that list item. Precisely. That is just an expected behavior. So there's no point in putting a chevron here. but you could certainly fill that space with something else, a star. A star uh, there's a checkbox on the other side. If you wanted to, you could even go nuts. This is a little bit small, but you know, you can usually get away with one or two things on the right-hand side mm. that have nothing to do with the details for that list item Absolutely. because it makes your user's life easier. And of course, there's always uh, the idea of putting a little tear-off corner to bring up a contextual item list or to, to long press for contextual items. Absolutely. So I think you know, that would be a nice thing here would be you know, really simple, replace the carrots with stars and, and just add that favorites flow um, you know, directly into the user experience. The other couple of things I wanted to highlight real quick is, uh, is up the top here, we have uh, coupons. So we've got coupons, we've got loyalty card integration. It's basically everything that you could want. And, and it's really an app that's really spent a lot of time thinking about what is it that you want a replacement shopping list piece of paper to do to really enrich that experience and make it something that you can justify using instead of just writing it down. And like you said, it really builds on itself. It's useful the moment it loads. And as I want more functionality, it's relatively easy to find. So even though the design of this app is fairly dated, and you can tell that the buttons that come from the Froyo era and the tab bar hasn't really been used in a while, and we could probably do a view pager and some other nice mm -hmm. things, doesn't matter. The, the core design, the flow of the application, has been really well thought out to make it easy for users to get the most out of it. Although I did need to point out, and this is just for that one dude that was on our YouTube page earlier. This is a menu button of shame. <laughs> shame. <laughs> shame. But, uh, but really what it is is just a, a really obvious example of the fact that this is an app which people have spent a lot of time and effort making really great, probably hasn't been updated from that design perspective since the initial designs when this app came out. And so Absolutely. That's the big piece of feedback we, we would have uh, for Grocery IQ Love the app. Let's uh, maybe take the opportunity now that the Holo theme has been out for a while. We have the design site, so you no longer have to play the guessing game of what the Android guy is going to do next. Right. It's up there. It's been pretty standard, and, and that's mm -hmm. definitely a, a, a style and a design that we're going to be sticking with for a while. Um, so now I think is a, a great opportunity to maybe think about a tablet app, think about doing a, a redesign. And in fact, uh, Roman, Nick, and Adam are going to be uh, performing a design makeover on Grocery IQ next Tuesday. So it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. And stay tuned, by the way. We don't have a time yet for this, but sometime in the next couple weeks, we are going to do an interview with the design team, and they are going to explain the whole menu button issue, and we are going to get set straight. So, so. Uh, yeah, that should be interesting. Stay tuned for that. Right. Um, so there's a couple of specific technical implementation uh, details which I wanted to cover as well. Um, so these are things that Grocery IQ uh, does well, well, could do better. And again, mm -hmm. I think in both of the cases here, it's stuff which is 
probably post-dates when this app was built. So hopefully it's stuff that we can point out to the developers and, uh, and they can implement as well Absolutely. to make the app that little bit neater. Uh, so the first is around the way that the app sends updates. So okay. right now, uh, you, there is a menu option that you can select um, to say how often you want it to pull the servers to check to see whether Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you say it's pull the servers? Yeah. And you've <laughs> seen the problem right there, right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, 1985 called. They want their data update method back. <laughs> so, and, and the bad news is the, the, the highest number you can set is five minutes, which kind of makes sense because I want my shopping list to be bang up to date. but. I really don't know that I want my phone firing up the cell network and, and transferring data back and forth between a server. Yeah, there's got to be a better way. There has to be. And in fact, there is a better way, and that's Google Cloud Messaging. Um, and, and that's what I'm going to uh, attempt to display on the screen behind me. Uh, so you start off with your app that's running on each of the user's phones. Um, so that's what we're looking at up here. Now, what you need to do first is register the phone with the Google Cloud Messaging server. Um, and that's going to uniquely identify this device with a particular user on it with Google. That's then going to send a message back up to the device. I'm going to stop pointing because clearly I'm bad at this. We're the presenter, not in my future. Ah. But uh, what you now have on each of the devices is a unique address which you can then use um, from your server via Google Cloud Messaging to talk to that particular app. So the next thing you need to do is actually send that down uh, to your server. And uh, now what your server has, hopefully, is a hash of the username or user identifier that has logged into that particular phone and that phone combined. Uh, and now you have an address that you can send messages using. Um, so you're basically all set to go. So what happens now is a user using their tablet at home makes a change to a shopping list. You send that down to your server. Your server goes, oh, OK, yep updated the lists, now I need everyone to who has access to this shared list to see what the changes are. So it is now going to send a message to the Google Cloud Messaging to each of those apps using the addresses which you've got registered with it. Google Cloud Messaging is then going to send that to each of the devices which are going to get pinged. Uh, using an intent receiver they're going to go, oh, okay, look, I have changes to this. Um, so they then have the option to ping the server and ask for those specific updates, or if it's a small enough change, you can actually package it uh, in the payload of the message that you're going to send. Look, Ian's in the cloud. <laughs> um, so that's basically how it works. And so you don't ever have to do polling. You're basically just updating the server, and the server is uh, directly transmitting that information to each of the devices um, which need to be updated. Yay. OK, so that's a, that's a great tip, and it's a, something that you should really check into, because it doesn't really cost you anything. No. Uh, it's, it's, it's entirely cost free, but it does mm -hmm. save your device, your user's devices, a lot of battery life, and mm -hmm. actually means that the latency between changes is reduced as well. So it's kind of win-win. Exactly. Now, of course, th this isn't magic. I mean, it's not like we're, you know, we don't have a way to just phone up that device. There still is polling involved, but the, the important thing is that all of the uh, messages are sent in one batch instead of each app making its own network connection and possibly screwing up the network connection using not only bandwidth but battery and CPU time as well. Exactly. Um, OK, so there was another tip as well which I wanted to point out. And that uh, is about how to share those contact lists. So at the mm -hmm. moment, you hit uh, share this list, and it will pop up a, a dialog asking for an email address, which is reasonable. But I don't memorize email addresses anymore. No, you know I don't memorize anything. Yeah, phone numbers, email, I don't because it's all in my Gmail or mm -hmm. my Google Plus. And all of that's synced to my phone. So every way I have to contact with someone is already in the phone. So I kind of resent having to type something that already exists. Yeah. So uh, rather than asking users to copy and paste email addresses, you can use a contact picker. Uh, so they can choose a contact from the existing contact list. Uh, and the way that works is actually pretty straightforward. You start by creating an intent. Again, mm -hmm. a lot of things tend to work with intents. Uh, and this time, the action is pick. And the, con and the data that you want to pick from is contacts. Or to put it more specifically, if slightly less clearly, the uh, contacts contracts content provider. I love the it. Yeah. Th these things are actually just made to be tongue twisters, aren't they? Absolutely. Now, we love the alliteration here at Android. So there'll be a lot of A words um, as much as we can anyway. 
Um, so you send out that intent, start an activity for result. So that's going to then open up Contacts Picker. User's going to click on something, and that's going to send you back a URI. And what this massive screen full of code does is actually pretty straightforward. We get a URI to a particular contact back from the contact picker. We're going to extract that ID by using a query on, uh, on the content provider. Once we have that, we're going to use that ID to then make another query, this time on the database or the content provider, which contains the email addresses. So we're basically going to say, we have this ID. What is the associated email? Uh, and that's what you see here, is that, that last part of actually pulling out the email address from the, uh, the query result of that cursor. Um, so once you've done that, you've got the email address. It's good form to then just pop that into the, uh, the edit text, make sure the user can confirm it, modify it if necessary, before you go and send off the email. Cool. So it's, it's, it's a fairly straightforward process, and I think something which really makes life a lot easier. And, and in fact, you mm -hmm. can possibly even go a step further here, which is, well, you have the email address, and if you're logging people in using their email addresses, then maybe you don't need to send them an email. If they already have an account, maybe you can just send a notification direct to their phone. Exactly. Maybe you could do both. Maybe you could do both. Exactly. Um, yeah. So let's have a look. So let's uh, let's move on to the uh, to the next app, which was uh, Zoom Tools. Exactly. So Zoom Tasks has a gorgeous feature graphic, absolutely, and really nice design. And honestly, it it does almost nothing. It's um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bare bones task app. It doesn't it's, it's seem. It's a beautiful it, looking app, it, which has all of the marketing stuff done perfectly. It's really an example of exactly what you should do to make sure that your app is likely to be downloaded. Actually, it, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. The, um, there's a ton of stuff that we could talk about, um, starting with where they got that check mark. I don't think we should even show that. <laughs> Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> I'm going to end up in a sweatshop in Southeast Asia somewhere. Um, but what I did want to point out is what happens when you fill out a, a form incorrectly. Now, hmm. Obviously, you never want to punish your user for doing something. But there are certain cases where you have to do data validation. You know that there's probably something wrong when you've tried to add a task without a name, for instance. Well, that's, that's the example they chose. Exactly. So I'm going to hit OK here. Uh, but I haven't put in a task title. And if you see that, yeah. it's wiggling. It's exactly. It's it it out. I love it. It's going, no, no, <laughs> no. So it's a universal signal that you got something wrong in this particular piece of UI. Hey, pay attention to this bit. Right. But it doesn't give you a toast that says, please do not press that button again. It doesn't give you a dialogue that says, you screwed up. Press OK to accept this and move on with your life. <laughs> Instead, it just gives you a little nudge to say that. Eh, Something maybe a little off here. Look at this. Right. Yeah, absolutely. This isn't the only way you could do it. I mean, you could turn the field red. You could put a little exclamation point next to it. The point is that you want your data validation to be a unintrusive and b specific. Mm. People should not have to read your text in order to figure out what they did wrong. This is beautiful because I could use this even if I didn't speak English. Yeah. I love this feature, and I really like the way that they've implemented this particular little shake. It's it's buttery, it's nice, and it just gets the job done. Absolutely, and, and that's I think kind of the the resounding theme for this app is that it, it's designed really well. It's it's simple. It's got those nice little bits of polish, but uh, almost ironically, or, or certainly different from my usual expectations. The polish is there, the functionality isn't. Now, in fairness, we are comparing it in a category up against apps that are designed to optimize the shopping experience rather than specifically to-do lists, which this is really more an example of. But even still, if you look at an apps like uh, Tasks from uh, Tasks Team, they kind of do a neater job. Apart from anything else, this doesn't synchronize to uh, a, a service anywhere. So if it's if the only place that I can get to it is on my device. If my device gets flashed, this is gone forever. Yep. And that's that's kind of a that kind of sucks. Yeah, yeah, that gets old. Okay, so I don't think we want to talk about Zoom tasks anymore, and we are just about out of time if we were going by real world time as opposed to the fake time that we use when we screw stuff up in the middle of the show. That's right. And then that time doesn't count. No, it does not. But uh, let's have a look. So one of the, uh, I think the last app that we wanted to look at was uh, Prixing or Preen, depending on how you choose to mispronounce a French word. Um, and the thing about this app, the defining feature of this app is that it is entirely in French. 
Right. Which is fine. Um, there's, there's certainly no problem with that, except that uh, we we don't speak French. No, so it's so it's difficult it for us to for us to fairly sort of evaluate it, um, and so we, we won't really go into much detail. I here. will say that I wanted to use it because yes, it's a beautiful it's looking, really app. really pretty. They've used pictures everywhere that it makes sense. It just, there isn't any boring text. It's laid out like a magazine. I really really like it. It makes you want to go shopping. Exactly. The only concern that I have is as I tap on some of these beautiful pictures, it's taking me to web views, it's taking me out of the app. So I do question, any app that launches a web view makes me think, well, maybe this app isn't actually all that functional. Yeah, it gets when it takes me out to the internet. Why am I having to go to, to the browser or to a web view to do that functionality? Again, it's right. hard to be entirely fair without knowing exactly what we're pressing. It may say, click here to view this on a web page, but. <laughs> that's, that's quite true. <laughs> that might be right. This this particular style of picture might be the universal I'm a web page picture in exactly. certain French speaking areas of the world. We have so, no idea. Yeah. So um, it looks like a really fully featured app. Certainly the reviews that it gets on Google Play are very, uh, very encouraging. It is a beautiful looking app. It's got things like coupons and uh, you know loyalty cards and all the sorts of stuff that we saw in Grocery mm -hmm. IQ and uh, Out of Milk. But unfortunately, we can't really review it because we don't speak the language. Now, that does actually bring up two kind of important points. Mm -hmm. And one is that I should kind of be able to use an app like this without being able to speak the language which it's written in. Possibly, yeah. You know, it may be a stretch, but here I wasn't able to get very far at all before just going, oh, I don't know what to do. I can't believe you don't even have like French-speaking friends, though. I probably, well, I mean, yeah, it's a shame there's no French-speaking You're not even American. The Android team. It would be, no. yeah. Anyway, but uh, so so that may be a tip. So uh, and this this goes for people writing English language apps as well. See what happens when you uh, translate all of your apps into uh, gibberish, and see whether it's usable. Uh, that's I think a that's, fantastic idea. It's yeah. kind of a really good way to see how does the Maybe flow work. What are the UX fuzz testing basically? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's like well, if you put this in front of someone and they don't know what the words are, can they still figure it out? Does what are the buttons they're pressing by default? Because whatever flow they do instinctively you want to be the right flow. And so you want the words to just back up what they intuitively feel like they should be doing. And the other tip, of course, is maybe consider an English translation. Right? There's mm -hmm. a lot of English speakers. Um, it's, it's probably one of the, one of, if not the largest market in terms of your Android consumers are going to be English speakers. Mm -hmm. um, so consider investing in that translation, particularly because Prixing has been around for a while. Really popular, uh, great way to grow your user base. Unless the app's only useful in France or French-speaking places. In okay. which case, it makes a lot of sense to go ahead and just take it out of the English-speaking market. Because remember, any time that you have your app presented to people who aren't going to be able to use it, whether it's because their phone isn't high-tech enough, or they don't have the right API level, or in this case, they don't, have, they don't speak the language that you do, you're going to get at least some people who are frustrated and give you bad reviews because of that, and you don't deserve that. No, you want to make sure that you are. You know, we encourage people to build apps which are usable by as many different people on as many different devices as possible. If you choose not to, that's fine. But you know, don't uh, don't encourage negative feedback by offering it to people who aren't going to be able to use it. Exactly. Cool. Well, I think that uh, gets us to the end of our app list. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's take a look at some of the specific prescriptions that we have uh, for these apps. Uh, so these are the things I that we would love people to do to, to take it to the apps to the next level. Absolutely. I can't wait. Before we do, though, it occurs to me that we haven't checked in with Producer Lewis in a while. Hey, Producer Lewis. How's the YouTube stream going? YouTube stream is going very well. There are questions around Grocery IQ being available in Central Europe. It appears that it is not. Okay. Uh, so there are concerns about uh, geographic availability. Mm -hmm. uh, people are very excited to see the code samples. They're encouraged to use cl the cloud in terms of publishing their apps. Outstanding. So that's very good. Good to hear. There are also uh, some input feedback for uh, talking about how you would get prices for items from different stores and put them into the app. Excellent. It's probably unusual that people will do that and shop around, but for those who want to, they would like to be able to add that to apps like Grocery IQ. I think that's a great right. idea, although that sounds like... Now, I'm sorry, did we mic Producer Lewis? That's uh, what I no, was speaking loudly toward Rio. I hope I so. So yes, just the just about coming through. Okay, well, <laughs> it, just in case. The, so the, the question, the, the last question was just around uh, collecting information from different stores, pricing information, things like that. Uh, Absolutely, but I think this seems like one of those things where 
there's a business opportunity. Absolutely. Right? I mean, I could go around to a bunch of stores and collect price information, but what would be even more interesting is if I sent a dozen guys around with, you know, backpack cameras or something, and they collected some price information for me, and then I put that in the cloud and monetized it in some way. So, something to think about. Yeah, and I think it's, it's an interesting challenge when you're looking at price comparison especially. For it to be really useful within an app, you want to be able to pu pull in a real-time feed of prices from all the different competitive uh, supermarkets, particularly if we're talking about groceries. And I'm sure those APIs exist, but probably not in a way that will allow you to do exactly that. Because There's no Sabre system for groceries? It's, it's probably not what the grocery stores want you to do. No. You know, have a, the same list and know exactly which shop to go to. I'll, I'll tell you, let me give you a, a, a real world example though, because it, you know, as we've discussed on the store, the, the whole point of going to college and, and working for Google is that I don't have to count pennies on my grocery bill. Uh, so I don't. I don't care how much my beer costs, unless it's at that one place that sells the 9.95 beer for 17.95. Yes, Those exactly. guys ripped me off, man. <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you what what I do count: calories. That's so, yeah, after after working for Google for three years, I'm 30 pounds heavier than I was when I started. Love to get my calories down. That's something that I would love to see budgeted in a shopping app. Absolutely. And it ha just so happens that at least in the United States, uh, the FDA, the government, uh, has a database of many different foods That's and their cool. nutritional information. And you can see apps that do this. There's, uh, I think the Withings app does it. There's uh, several fitness apps that mm -hmm. do it. But it would be right. great if that could be in the shopping app too. Again, because this is really going back to what we were saying. Um, you know, it's really about trying to add as much functionality as you can, which you would have to go to other places. And, and the beauty of this is you have to create a shopping list. And what we're really talking about here is incentivizing you to do that shopping list in this app by saying, if you write it down here once, then suddenly we'll be able to give you recipe ide ideas based on the things that you bought. Uh, we'll be able to tell you the, the caloric intake of the things that which were in this list. We can keep track of your international brie buying uh, budget over time to see whether it's trending up or trending down. These are the sorts of things which I think can really add benefit. Exactly. But, uh, let's let's get let's go ahead and take. So a, let's have a yeah. look. We'll step out of the way of. Uh, out of milk, um, and again, I think we mentioned this before. Would be would have been useful to uh, to copy this text somewhere we could actually read it. But we'll let you guys read it and give, I guess, overall. Right. Well, I, I can almost read it because I have uh, better Super eyes busy. than you. Yeah, awesome. indeed. Now, um, so yeah. Better glasses, but the uh, good folks in the uh, Google Drive team kicked them off my face in soccer this week. So uh, I've had to revert <laughs> to an. Oh, you don't even know what that cost me to set that up. Okay. Um, so for out of milk, th there are several design things that we, we would like to be seen, but uh, the functionality seems really nice, and we just like it to be easier to get to. So how about the contacts picker? How about letting me sign in with my account without having to uh, put in my email address? Um, let's uh, go on then. Uh, so the next app uh, was uh, Grocery IQ, and we really, really like this app. Why did um, we put this behind the scenes? Can we, can no, we can put it in front, or? certainly. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what? I, I can't actually read it. No, I can't. lied. The thing about Grocery IQ, I think, really what it comes down to, apart from the specific things that we've got there. Oh, look I'll at us. You, I'll let you read. Oh, oh, I see. So we can actually read. Oh, that's, oh, nice that's cool. It's wheels within wheels. Wow. Thanks for this Chromebook, Lewis. So I can't shy. believe how useful it is. Okay. Really, I think the, the key thing for me for Grocery IQ is, uh, you know, you've got great designers. They created a really great workflow, user flow uh, for an earlier time in the Android ecosystem. And I'd love, love, love to see this app with the same functionality just, and the same designers, frankly, but just making it consistent with what we currently expect to see uh, in Android. Yeah, it just needs to be updated. It needs to use Google Cloud Messaging instead of polling. That's really important. And then, as we said with with the other apps, a little bit tighter integration in terms of contacts, URLs, and account management would be really welcome. Well, basically, all of the things we're talking about have been uh, relatively recently added to Android. And so I think it, it literally is a case uh, for this app of something which has been designed, has done really, really well, mm -hmm. has the functionality it needs, and now it just needs to have those occasional refreshes to take advantage of the new features that right. the Android platform has. Move along. So Zoom tasks. Keep going. Keep on trucking, buddy. It's, uh, it's, it's beautiful. It's wonderful to see someone who's 
putting so much thought and effort into the design side, definitely an inspiration for people in terms of what you should be doing on your Google Play listing in terms of your icon design to create something really compelling. Mm -hmm. Just need to follow through now and, and see some more functionality added into the app. You know what's going to happen now. What's going to happen? Uh, Roman's going to pick this one for Android design in action, and he's going to prove us wrong. He's going to just tell us how everything should be different. Ha happily, I've looked into the future, and I happen to know which of the two apps that Roman will be reviewing. So uh, it won't be Zoom tasks. Uh, I'll see you. Chris, now that I think about it, Zoom tasks didn't have any gradients anywhere, so Roman wouldn't care. That's true. Roman probably loves it. <laughs> it probably does. Uh, and the last app we looked at was uh, was Prixing. And Prixing, the, the main problem for us is that we just don't speak this language. I don't know why we reviewed it, not speaking the language. Because we love a challenge. And we just wanted to f just sort well, of flaunt in, our ignorance. In, it, well, <laughs> it, well, like we need to flaunt it. It's it's clearly obvious to anyone who cares to look. Uh, it actually was the highest scored uh, app, both on the Trello page and on Moderator. People really That's wanted us to look at it, yeah. uh, which implies there are a lot of French speakers watching the show. So, uh, bonjour. Uh, and that's about as far as I can go in French. And that's only because it's also a network protocol. So we will uh, sure. maybe get some French speakers out here to, Absolutely. to well, help maybe, us out. Yeah, well, maybe get, yeah, uh, the entire graphics team is French, basically. <laughs> exactly. Okay. It shouldn't be too much of a stretch. Um, Perfect. So okay. that, that was each of the apps that we wanted to look at, and uh, we're basically up to an hour. So that's that's all for today's app clinic. Uh, Roman, Nick, and Adam will be performing a design makeover of some of today's apps. Uh, in particular, they're going to look at Grocery IQ and Out of Milk, which is great. They're two of our favorites. Uh, and that'll be on Android Design in Action on Tuesday. And uh, we'll also be checking in on the patients uh, which we looked at today and in the previous weeks over the next few weeks to see how they're coming along. Great. Now make sure you visit our Trello page to nominate the apps and the categories you'd like to see us review. We've got decided to move away from Moderator because Trello is way more hip. So we threw Moderator on the ground, not a part of their system. Next week we'll be looking at Trello to see if anyone has nominated Halloween themed apps. Reto was convinced that such it's a thing a existed. Holiday. There's pumpkins on everyone's porch. I believed that there was no such thing. I may have been proven wrong in so, this instance. So next week, it's going to be trick or treat. We're going to <laughs> we're going to review whatever we feel like. Exactly. If if you are satisfied with Ian proving me wrong, then by all means, uh, don't nominate any further apps. If you would like to see me proven right, please, please. Oh, absolutely. If apps. you have a candy scanner, if you have a where's the best house in the neighborhood for loot, if you have a, a something that automatically locates homemade popcorn balls and UNICEF pennies, go ahead. Nominate that stuff. We want to see it. I'm sure it exists. I refuse to believe that they don't. I think people are just bogarting the good Halloween apps because they don't want other people. If everyone has an app that tells you where the best place to get candy is, then there are no best places to get candy. Oh, the Incredibles quote. Nice. Well, we'll see next week. I'm going to try it out, see what happens see what uh, in our special Halloween episode where uh, I think I'll be going as a doctor. Outstanding. <laughs> I don't know how you come up with these things. No, I'm clever that way. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name's Red and Mine. I'm Ian Nee Lewis. And this was the App Clinic. Take care. Thanks for watching. <laughs>